Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I just wanted to um, start off by saying thank you for joining and um, how we're excited to um, present you this event today. Um, in collaboration with our College of Health and Human Sciences Student Success Center, our faculty presenters and our co-presenters, um, Dr. Denise Dawkins and um, Francisco Nunez and Raisa Chiara Olenglenko. Uh, we just want to um, say we're very excited to host this event and spotlighting the research that our faculty have done in their prospective fields. Um, my coworker here, my colleague Renee, will introduce our um, presenters. And first I'm going to cover the housekeeping. So for today's event, we invite you to turn your videos on if you feel led to, if you're comfortable. Uh, you may unmute yourself if you have any stories or experiences to share or any thoughts. And the chat box is available as well, so you can put your questions there and as well as your thoughts and any comments or questions. Um, feel free also to use the reaction buttons. And um, the outline of today's event will have uh, Dr. Hampton first present her presentation along with her co-presenters with a five minute Q&A followed by Dr. Xiong Ho Cheng and uh, Francisco Nunez's presentation. And then we'll have another Q&A with their presentation. Okay, so with that being said, I'll hand it off to Renee. Thank you so much. Um, like Natalie said, I, am, um, I also work in the, uh, the College of Health and Human Sciences Student Success Center as an advisor. Um, Natalie, do you mind giving me permission to share my screen so that I can, ah, there it is. <laughs> okay. So I have the privilege today of introducing our uh, faculty that we will be spotlighting. So first is um, Dr. Michelle Hampton, um, and she will be presenting on systemic barriers to RN education for Black students in the U.S. Um, she is currently an associate professor in the Valley Foundation School of Nursing. She graduated from UC San Francisco School of Nursing with her Master of Science in Nursing and PhD. And her clinical specialization is adult psychiatric mental health nursing with an emphasis on severe mental illness. Um, her research interests include uh, health disparities and equity in mental health care and in nursing education. Um, she has a couple of co-presenters today. Uh, one is her co-investigator, Dr. Denise Dawkins, who is an assistant professor in the Valley Foundation School of Nursing. And, uh, and one of her other pre presenters is Ms. Raisa Onglenko is a student nurse and a research assistant for the study. Uh, we also have, um, oh, I guess I will introduce Dr. Chang um, once Dr. Hampton is completed. So um, with that, take it away, Dr. Hampton. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen so you guys can see my slides. Let me get my presentation started. Sorry about that. Okay, so you already have heard the the title of our presentation and you know that I have my two co-presenters here who I'm uh, so grateful to have had as teammates on this project. Uh, we are um, interested in uh, equity in nursing education and we focus specifically on Black students for this study. Uh, nursing is the largest healthcare profession of, you know, 
medicine, physical therapy, all of the different fields of healthcare, uh, there are 3.8 million RNs and only 9.9% are black. And this is an issue because underrepresentation of black health professionals is believed to contribute to health disparities. And when we talk about health disparities, we mean differences in health outcomes, but not those that are associated with a personal choice, but rather differences that occur as a result of differences in systems of care or systemic discrimination and bias. And that bias can be conscious or unconscious and still have negative effects on health. For example, we've heard about the different COVID mortality rates between black and Latinx adults compared to whites. And you might've heard uh, you've probably heard a lot of reports about vaccine hesitancy in Black communities uh, in relationship to low vaccination rates for Black people, but we hear less about the decision made nationwide for the first year to include people over 65, even though Black people have a lower life expectancy and might not make it to that age group. We hear less about Black people lacking health insurance and access to a primary care provider who might be able to answer questions for you if you're feeling concerned about the safety of the vaccine. We're also hearing less about the use of online systems to make vaccine appointments when many people lack internet access. So if we just assume that Black people don't want the vaccine, then that hinders the ability to address those issues that are real and underlie what we're just calling vaccine hesitancy. So in the vaccine clinics, the clinics that I've been volunteering in, I've noticed that the public health nurses are really running the show there. And so we know that in many different specialty areas, nurses are the gatekeepers to healthcare. And similarly, nursing faculty are the gatekeepers to the profession. So we have to look to ourselves to resolve issues of inequity. So there are some parts of the country where representation of black nurses is pretty close to their representation in the general population. But in a 2014 study, it was found that there's one region of the US where the gap is particularly uh, problematic. And you can see in this slide, the blue line represents the general population uh, comprised of black people. And then the red line is the RN population. And you can see on the right side, there's a very wide gap and almost all of those states are in the South. And based on the graphic that I just showed, we can assume that these disparities don't stem just from people opting out of nursing as a profession. They're not choosing that. So there must be some structural or systemic barrier that's affecting the ability of black adults to enter into the nursing profession. And that's where we think of structural racism. And structural racism is defined as the normalization and legitimization of institutions and practices that routinely advantage white people and disadvantage black, indigenous and other people of color. Uh, and by uh, using the yes or no buttons on your Zoom, how many of you are familiar with the term achievement gap? And uh, you can put it in the chat also. But if you have or haven't heard about it, this is usually used in reference to white and black students. And without a knowledge of structural racism, you might be led to believe that black students have less intellectual ability, a poor work ethic, or maybe they or their parents just don't value education a great deal. But with it, you might realize that systemic barriers like school segregation, funding deficits, wealth and health inequities contribute to these differences in academic performance. And it's not a reflection of the ability of the student. And so uh, in the 60s, affirmative ad action was enacted to offset the effects of structural racism. But then after it was repealed in 1996, we saw an immediate decline in admission of black students to institutions of higher education. And this was most significantly seen in public universities like our CSUs and our UCs. But black students didn't defer going to college. They did, however, shift their enrollment to private and for-profit institutions. And with that, you can imagine that there are, uh, there's a greater resulting debt and economic burden. So what have institutions done to address health inequity or access inequities for black students since the ban? And the answer is not a great deal. There's no national or state legislation that requires it. However, there has 
been a, a movement to promote the adoption of holistic admissions uh, by some organizations. And one is the Association of American Medical Colleges. In 2014, they offered some guidance and provided this uh, model called the EAM model, stands for Experiences, Attributes, and Academic Metrics. And the central tenet is that while we can use academic metrics like GPA and standardized test scores to make admissions decisions, we also want them to be informed by experiences and attributes, things that might indicate that an applicant possesses social skills, a service orientation, or other qualities that are really important for a healthcare professional. It also emphasizes that race and ethnicity can be a consideration when it aligns with the university or the program's mission. So the purpose of this study was to identify barriers to Black student admission to RN programs, and that's associate and baccalaureate degree programs. And we considered proximity of the schools to communities with a high Black resident population uh, because Black students tend to go closer to home. Uh, we considered the affordability of program options, what was the availability of public versus private institutions, as well as what's the general income of the area located around the school, and then the selectivity of admission criteria. And we looked at those comparing the southern region to the northeast, the midwest, and the west. And then Dr. Dawkins will tell you about how we went about answering those questions. She's too fast. Um, takes me a minute to unmute because um, I have helpers here. Um, the design, um, we used a cross-sectional design and the data was collected between March and December of 2020. Our sample was associate and baccalaureate nurses programs in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Programs were eligible <clears throat> if they were accredited by the um, by one of the professional nursing organizations. Um, we did not, however, look at nursing programs in Puerto Rico or looked at second degree programs, also known as accelerated programs. What we looked at were um, the program characteristics, which would be, where, was it a public school or a private school? The mission criteria, we searched um, the school sites to um, extract data. So we looked at their mission statement admission rubrics, student handbooks, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and catalogs. Then we went into the, um, the, the census under quick facts to um, access zip codes and, and use it to search databases that exacted the um, percentage of black residents, mean income and state income. Also, we looked at the national um, sample of survey, nursing survey. This is a big survey that's usually done every four years, and it looks at the char characteristics of the um, workforce of RNs. Um, the procedure was five of us. We divided the work and independently worked and looked up um, different parts of the um, data after we were trained by um, Dr. Hampton. Then Dr. Hampton mer merged the data and validated each entry's work, <clears throat> looked at range checks, means, frequencies, um, calculated any, um, we did it to reconcile any inconsistencies or missing data points. Um, we used uh, IBM SPSS version 27.0 to, um, to look at the identifying characters, characteristics of the program, frequencies, percentages were um, calculated. We used cross, cross, um, cross analysts compared the um, categorical variables for the programs in the South to those in the Midwest and the Northwest and the West. And then we used the cross Google um, Wallace test to compare the continuous um, variables for each, um, excuse me, for each region. Thanks. So uh, the total number of programs that we evaluated was 2,298. 776 of those were associate degree, 771 BSN, <coughs> and 751 were RN to BSN programs. And for those who don't know, those are programs for students who obtained an associate degree first, and then they can go on to complete a bachelor's degree, usually in about three additional semesters. The most common admission criteria were included in the analyses, and these were 
uh, organized according to the EAM model that we just talked about. So five each under the categories of experiences and attributes and seven under academic metrics. And then there was one additional category that we termed other preconditions, and it wasn't related to any academic ability, but the five most common in this category were health and liability insurance, background checks, drug screens, and proof of citizenship or residency. In the next several slides, you'll see bar graphs that show comparisons of the South to the Northeast, West, and Midwest. So the two columns on the left are the associate degree programs and the two columns on the right are the baccalaureate degree programs or the BSN programs. The statistically significant regional differences included uh, HBCU programs. This was expected because most HBCUs are in the South, but for uh, BSN programs alone, the, there were more public institutions in the South and there were more two-step programs in the South. And for those who might not be familiar, there are one-step programs where students are admitted directly from high school. And then there are two-step programs where students are first admitted to the college, take one or more years to complete prerequisite courses and then apply to the nursing program. And the South had uh, more two-step programs. For the M component of the EAM model, the academic metrics, the most commonly used criteria were overall GPA and standardized tests. Uh, over, it was notable that overall GPA was more commonly used even though science GPA is a better predictor of student success in nursing programs. And then for standardized tests, this included not only the general tests like SAT and ACT, but also uh, nursing specific standardized tests like the TEAS and HESI, and many schools use both. For ADN programs in the South, they were significantly more likely to use standardized tests and placement tests, and BSN programs in the South were more likely than other regions to have a requirement for two or more GPAs and strict limits on prerequisite repeats. So either they didn't allow any at all, or they had a maximum of only one. In the E or experience category, there was only one statistically significant finding and the South was less likely than the other regions to require a nursing assistant certification. But there was one other thing in this category that stood out for me. And that was that in the associate degree programs in the South, they were more likely, though not statistically significant, uh, they were more likely to uh, give preference to people who had a bachelor's or some other sort of degree. And I thought that was a little counterintuitive, almost like the rich getting richer, that you'd have to have a bachelor's degree in order to get into an associate degree program. In the A or attribute category, uh, the ADN programs in the South were significantly more likely to interview applicants and less likely to factor in volunteer or life experience. And then for BSN programs in the South, they were significantly less likely to accept essays or references. And then for the other preconditions category, the associate degree programs in the South were significantly more likely to require drug screens. And then for BSN programs in the South, they were significantly more likely to require health insurance, liability insurance, background checks, and drug screens. And uh, the, there's a cost associated with doing all those additional steps, but we'll also talk more later about the implications of this re these requirements in addition to that. And then the next two slides, uh, these represent the regional comparisons of the continuous variables, and that includes the percentage of Black residents, Black RNs in the state, the gap in representation, and the percentage of the state income. Uh, and as Dr. Dawkins told you, we used the Kruskal Wallace test for the analysis. So you'll see here the median value, the p value, and then the order of the regions ranked from highest to lowest according to their mean rank. So for the percentage of black residents in the area, black RNs and the percentage gap in representation, the South's mean rank exceeded all other regions. And then for the percentage of state income in the local area around the school, the South was only exceeded by the West. So pretty high incomes. 
And then things varied a bit when looking at the counts for the number of criteria within each category and overall. And the programs in the South use significantly more academic metrics and other preconditions. And then they were lowest in the use of attribute criteria and next to lowest for experience criteria. And then for overall number of criteria, the South was lower only than the West. But then when you look at the West, the region with the smallest gap, they were also highest in terms of experience and second highest in terms of use of attribute criteria. And then finally, there was one other tidbit that isn't reflected in the chart, but we conducted t-test to compare HBCU criteria to non-HBCUs and found that there was no significant difference. They were just as heavy in academic metrics with very little use of attribute and experience criteria that we might consider being more holistic. So um, just to circle back to what our original goals were with regard to proximity, there are lots of black residents who live in close proximity to nursing programs. And that was across the board for associate and baccalaureate degree programs alike. So that's not a, an issue. Uh, affordability is kind of uh, goes both ways. So we saw that the percentage of state income might be a little higher in the South or than some other regions, the, the, the percentage of income around those local programs might be an issue. So it cost could be an, a, a part of it, but also we saw that most ADN and BS, ESM programs were public. And so we would presume that they cost less than private institutions, but since the ban of infer on affirmative action, we also know that black students are less likely to be re represented at public institutions. Then uh, that leaves us with selectivity. And we saw that programs in the South were more likely to have two-step processes, which would uh, expose them to more bias, not just at one stage, but two. And then having more academic metrics and less of the attribute and experience criteria, that's also uh, potentially a source of bias because there are several studies that indicate that the differences between black and white students, uh, GPAs and test scores, that's more associated with economic disparities rather than aptitude because white students are more likely to use prep courses to get tutoring and uh, students of color are more likely to spend time work and more hours working. Uh, so programs in the South were also more likely to have other preconditions such as background checks, drug screens, and health insurance. So um, we know that Black adults are also less likely to have health insurance. 11% of Black adults are uninsured compared to just 8% of whites. And so in addition to those economic obstacles, Ms. Anglinko is going to address the other ways that Black students can be disadvantaged by a background check or conduct report uh, requirement in the admission process. Raisa. So part of our research included looking into placings in schools and trying to see if there was a disadvantage between the black student population versus the white student population. Um, according to editorial projects in education, black youth were more likely to be arrested in school settings, even though black and white adolescents engaged in similar behaviors. And while black students make up only 15.5% of the overall student population in the US, they accounted for 33.4% of school arrests. <clears throat> in particular, five states in the South, um, including Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, Maryland, and Florida have the highest um, rates of school arrests. Um, according to Toldson in 2019, it was found in that in Chicago, primarily white schools managed fights by student separation and mediation with an adult present, while in primarily black schools, um, fights were typically handled with the rest of both students, um, which can lead to um, an increased chance of getting a criminal record and therefore increasing their chance of denial to continuing in nursing programs and ultimately becoming RNs. Okay, thank you. So before we wrap up, there are a few limitations to consider. Even though the gap was most pronounced in the South, it exists in all regions. And so the bias in admissions criteria can be present in 
uh, the South, the Northeast, the West, and the Midwest. We also wanted to avoid conflating the use of experience and attribute criteria with holistic admissions practices, because for the few programs that did report how they weighted different criteria, most of them still heavily relied on academic metrics in their admissions decisions. So there's a number of things we can do to begin to remove some structural barriers and to work toward increasing access to qualified black students. And so uh, we've got a list of eight recommendations and Dr. Dawkins is going to cover the first four. Dr. Dawkins. All right, well, I'll go ahead and do these. Uh, so the first recommendation is that we need professional nursing organizations to endorse the use of holistic admissions. Uh, if we could work something like this into accreditation processes, it could really serve as in impetus for schools to make meaningful changes in the absence of legislation to do so. Uh, the second is to resist deficit thinking. Sometimes one of the first things you hear when we talk about holistic admissions is, you know, we don't want to lower the standards um, and we want to have it be uh, to correct that thinking to say, you know, admitting more black and brown students doesn't mean that we're admitting unqualified students and we have to train faculty to kind of uh, go against that knee jerk thinking. The third recommendation is to revise mis mission statements to express a commitment to serving underrepresented students specifically, and not just saying having the word diversity in your mission statement. It doesn't uh, solve the problem 100%, but it is a beginning and it kind of gives you support to establish your, your goals and um, measure outcomes for accountability purposes. The fourth uh, recommendation is that HBCUs should create policies that support black student admission. And we saw photos of programs where almost every student in the HBCU uh, nursing program picture was other than black. And um, there's even one school that we saw found an article about that uh, is no longer serving black students. It's a majority white institution, but because it was designated as an HBCU uh, back in the 60s, it remains so. Uh, the fifth recommendation is that we recommend using academic metrics to establish a pool of qualified applicants, but to make selections based on those experience and attribute qualities, because even though um, there are some things that you'll see in schools uh, admission criteria, such as we uh, are going to give more credit to people from low socioeconomic status, first generation students, or they can speak a different language. That doesn't necessarily capture the issues that black students are dealing with. And though all black students might not be of low socioeconomic status or a first generation student, they've all likely been exposed to anti-black racism. The sixth recommendation is that we eliminate other preconditions. Not only can it have the economic uh, issues associated with it, but also uh, the over-policing of black students in school can disadvantage black students. For seven, we want to dedicate time and resources to admissions training. Too often faculty are kind of doing admissions on the side of their other uh, regular assignment and we aren't able to dedicate the time and attention needed to uh, do a good job uh, or an effective job of admitting a pool of applicants that is representative of our community. And then finally, the recommendation is to preserve ADN as an entry to practice. It often comes up for debate that we need to move entry level to bachelor's degree, but you saw that half of the programs between the ADN and BSN are ADN programs. And not only will that reduce the number of uh, nurses entering the profession, but it'll also disenfranchise possibly many other black and indigenous people of color. Um, 
I just had a couple of uh, additional points to make. Uh, there's a, an assumption when we review a prospective student's applicant, particularly when that student is black, uh, that a lower test score or GPA reflects an intellectual deficit, a poor work ethic, or they just don't care about their education. And Gloria Ladson Billings highlights that inequalities in health, their experiences in and out of school and socioeconomic status contribute to and exacerbate inequalities in education. And those are amplified and widened over time. But the most important thing is that it's unrelated to a student's inherent intelligence and aptitude. So what we can do is start by compensating for these inequities where we can, uh, just like we did when we still had affirmative action. Uh, we can remember the definition of structural racism and know that if we fail to make systemic changes that interrupt that business as usual practice, we'll continue to admit cohorts of students that have one, two, or possibly even no black students at all. And it's in our all of our interest to have health professionals that re reflect the makeup of our communities. So changing admission policy will not resolve the problem completely, as I said, but it is one important and tangible place to start. So uh, I just wanted to take a moment to thank my co-investigators again, Dr. Denise Dawkins, Dr. Sherry Rickman Patrick, and our nursing program director, Colleen O'Leary-Kelly, and our uh, SJSU nursing student research assistants, Raisa Onglenko, who's here with us today, Brenna Staub, Claire Palazzo, and also my daughter, Chloe Hampton, who all contributed many hours into data collection and completing this project. And thanks also to Talisha, Natalie, and Renee for giving us the opportunity to share our results. Any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Hampton and uh, Dr. Dawkins and Raisa. Now it's a time for questions for Q&A. So if anyone has any um, questions, now is the time to ask and um, you have a floor, you guys. I guess we lost Dr. Dawkins. Oh no, there she is. <laughs> or any comments um, from participants? Do you guys have any comments or questions? Now's the time. I, hello? Sure. Hi, I had a question or a comment. You said that the sample time period that you did the, um, the study was from March till when of last year? December. So the, the, data that you pulled, are you concerned that COVID and everything that happened with that affected that data? We did. Uh, so one of the things that came up in some of the admission criteria was that they would have, you know, a temporary change based on COVID. And so some schools were moving towards a permanent change of doing away with standardized tests. Others said, you know, this is just a temporary change based on COVID. And so in those cases, we used the previous year's criteria if it was just a, a temporary COVID change. Okay, about one more minute and then we'll move on to Renee introducing Dr. Xiong Ho Chang and Francisco Nunes. So if anyone has any other comments or questions, now's the time. Thank you so much for the research and I learned a lot too, so. Thank you. I just wanna make a comment and say thank you for um, working on this research. It's really important during this time. I mean, more than ever with the political climate and, and the, all the things that we're seeing in the world and it's so timely and not that it wasn't timely before, but I just wanna say thank you so much for doing this work. And I'm hoping that, um, we can take your research and really apply those recommendations to improving the way that um, we see education and we admit people and really celebrate the diversity. So thank you so much, Dr. Hampton and the team for doing this. Thank you, Sandy. Sandy is uh, my one of my DNP advisees. So I'm very pleased to see her here and my other DNP student, Rhonda, and my former student, Nene. <laughs> I also wanted to add a comment too, because you know, looking at the fact that the numbers are so low, and I can even say we're in my place of employment, out of 120 nurses, about five of us were black. 
in our department. And as far as with school, cause I was teaching at CSU as well. And I can tell you out of my 15 years, I've only saw black students come through the program. So this is hitting and this is so valid. So mm -hmm. it, it kind of made me think when I got accepted and I was part of that affirmative action situation mm -hmm. is probably how I got in. Yeah. And so, but this information is very important and we definitely need to change and, and make it uh, across the board for everyone who are qualified. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. And I was actually surprised myself when I came from my previous institution, which was private, I was thinking I'm going to go to a state system and it's going to be a better, you know, there's going to be more representation, but that's not the case at all. At all. At all. So true. Well, thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll hand it off to Renee. Okay. Uh, Talisha, will you share your screen quickly so we can introduce Dr. Chang? Sorry, having technical difficulties. I'll be right back. I, I can also do it as well. I was going to say, I think I have it up too. Yeah. <laughs> I can do it as well. Hold on. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, so now we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Chang uh, on his study that he has conducted uh, titled The Effective Movement Based Program SAMI Play on Motor and Social Skills for Children from Low Income Families and Ethnic Minorities. Um, Dr. Chang is an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Physical Activity Program Coordinator at uh, SJSU. Dr. Chang earned his PhD in kinesiology with a specialization in motor development and physical education, teacher education. Um, the primary research area that he um, is interested in is the motor competence, physical activity, and social skills of disadvantaged children children with developmental delays. Um, his co-presenter is Francisco, Francisco Nunez, my apologies, I can't talk, <laughs> um, who uh, received his Bachelor of Kinesiology and is a former um, program coordinator of SAMI Play and a doctoral student in the physical therapy program at Boston University. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Chang, take it away. Dr. Chang, I believe you're on mute. Mute, oh, can I share again? Right. Sorry about that. So you can see my PowerPoint, right? Yes. And we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. I mean, I'm not sure how many students are here right now, but um, everybody's tired and everybody's busy. But um, it's so glad to share my um, one of research I have done before. And then uh, I will present with my core uh, Presenter, the Francisco Nunes. Uh, he's a currently doctoral student at Boston University. He's, uh, he's uh, studying the physical therapy right now. So, just I want to uh, present a brief a background of this research. How I uh, how I uh, started this research, and then what what was uh, the background regarding this research first. So the fundamental motor skills are uh, consisting of object control skill. Here's a, for example, 
throwing, catching, and then kicking, and then locomotor skills, running, jumping, and then leaping and hopping are building blocks for more complex skills to participate in uh, physical activity and sporting later. Okay. And evidence is also supports that the mastering fundamental motor skill is one of the key underwriting mechanism driving physical activity behaviors, especially for the children. So we just know that it is very important to develop uh, mature levels of a fundamental motor skill in childhood. Especially the childhood is a common accepted, commonly accepted as a window of opportunity in which to develop the fundamental motor skill confidence. As I said, the fundamental motor skill is very important, but uh, many of the today's children have not developed the sufficient proficiency of level of fundamental motor skill. One such a group is children who are identified as a disadvantage or at risk of the educational failure and then developmental delay. These children, often grow up in low socioeconomical neighborhoods where there are significant barriers to physical activity and the ability to engage in activities and health uh, lifestyle. Because of a various uh, risk of factors, such as uh, outside environment is not safe and poverty, and then uh, parents are very busy to make money and kind of nature of a family dynamics. And also many research found that this population typically showed some level of impairments in skills relating to a social communicative behavior, such as a smiling, making an asking favor, expressing feelings or, or opinions. Even though these social skills are very important for the children in terms of interacting with their friends and the environment. So we have to start to think about how we can help these children promote their fundamental motor skill, movement skills, and their social skill. And then we have decided to conduct movement-based innovation study because we found that uh, movement-based movement skill is very, uh, was effective to promote um, movement of uh, motor skills for children, just a regular, um, ju just a typical children. So we thought about how we apply the previous uh, uh, research to the different population, okay? And then also we made a kind of a name for the uh, children who will participate in this, this program. So the program, is, program name is a semi-play. So the first of all, the purpose of this uh, intervention study, semi-play, was to promote a moral and social skills through the movement-based program for low-income and then minority children. Total 36 students participated in this uh, research, and then their uh, average age was uh, 7.3 years old. And then we conducted this research a public at a public elementary school serving primarily low-income and ethnic minority students in San Jose area. And then we provided uh, 12 sessions with uh, each session to lasting three, 30 minutes because we uh, considered their uh, attention span. And then we did a pre and post test. So before the intervention, before the program, we did a pre-test and then after the program, we did a post test. So two variables we measured uh, object control skill by using test of gross motor development tools. And then uh, we used a social skill checklists to measure their social skill, how they how their social skill has been changed after the uh, intervention. So children were randomly assigned either experimental group and the control group. And 
then children in experimental group receive the intervention. For example, they learned how to perform uh, object control skill, and then they just you know, played uh, kind of the uh, fun physical activities and the games. And also we provide it kind of a components of social skills such as, okay, after, before you start your, the, this program, you have to say hello. And then after the program, you have to say, thank you and bye. Or we taught how to take a turns and then how to cheer up of their friends using um, appropriate the expressions such as a good job and then great work uh, during the innovation. But the control group, there were 18 children. They didn't get any innovation. They just uh, played uh, what they want. And then we didn't provide any uh, organized physical activities for them. But the time is the uh, same, 12 sessions with uh, 30 minutes. So especially for the experimental group, the first five, uh, five uh, minutes, we uh, provided kind of a warm-up activities and the stretching and then some small uh, physical activity and then some types of uh, skill, uh, fun activities. And then we set up the four stations and then uh, each station we taught, for the each station we taught uh, movement object control skill. For example, the first, uh, station, we taught how to throw the ball. The second station, we taught how to dribble the ball, how to kick the ball. And then third station, we taught how to dribble the ball, bounce the ball. And then the last one, we'll, usually we taught how to roll the ball. And then we uh, provide uh, different types of the uh, activities, even though we taught uh, object control skill because uh, the students, as you know, get bored very easily. That's why we try to uh, provide the very fun activities and fun uh, stations. So what we found, after 12 sessions, we conducted a post-test. As you can see here, the student in uh, experimental group demonstrate a significant improvements regarding object control skill. Here's a control group, a little bit improved, but not, okay? And then in terms of social skills, the result from the social skill checklist to show that the children received the intervention improved their social skill from pre to post test compared to children in control group, especially their greeting skills and the sharing skill and the assisting skill. That means before the program, before the innovation, usually they didn't say hi, hello, something like that. And then they didn't know how to share the equipment uh, during the play. And then they didn't know how to assist, how to support the, uh, the teachers, but after 12 week, 12 sessions, they showed their uh, greeting skills. So whenever they met the, the instructor, they said, hello, how are you? And then after the program, they didn't uh, forget to say, thank you, see you next time. And then they know how to share and then their equipment during the program, during the session, and then during the activities. And then finally, after the session, after the station uh, activity, they knew that, knew how to assist the instructor and the other students. So here is a brief con conclusion. So we found that children were quickly able to catch up their motor skills with the semi program, I mean, the innovation, and then they developed a foundation of a motor competence, especially for the object control skills. And then not only did the children's motor skill improve, but they also improved their social skill. As I said, the greetings and assisting and the sharing kind of things. So we found that children are ready to learn, but um, and not receive the context that, that means uh, we didn't, they couldn't get the many opportunity to, uh, improve their movement skill and the level of physical activity 
or the social scale because of uh, the environment they are involved in. Just uh, this study was a pilot study because we had a very uh, small number of participants. So based on the result from this study, we will do the, the deeper study with a large sample size, and then we will develop the more uh, activities for the station. Finally, this research was not only the study, but also great opportunities for San Jose State students in terms of the service learning opportunity, community-based experiences, hands-on experiences, and also the student involved research because San Jose, student, San Jose State students uh, participate in this research as an assistant or instructor. And then some of the students did uh, their project for undergraduate research uh, grant. So they got the, some experiences regarding the research. So now I'll I will introduce uh, Mr. Francisco Nunes. Uh, he was our uh, San Jose State kinesiology student, and then he helped this program, and then he uh, conducted this research with me, and then he was a uh, the program coordinator. I mean the semi play, and then after that, with a good GPA and a good uh, careers, he just started a doctor program at a Boston University, and then I mean. I think he will graduate soon. So I will invite him and then he's gonna share what he learned and then what was good and then how this opportunity helped his uh, career. Uh, how's it going? Uh, my name is Francisco. I am a second year PT school, PT student at Boston University. Graduated from San Jose in 2018. Uh, so yeah, like Dr. Cheng said, I. Uh, essentially helped coordinate um, kind of within other students and uh, myself uh, kind of implementing the intervention which was the, the after school program uh, so basically just to sum it up it was a lot of fun uh, basically just playing with uh, the children in like a safe and organized fashion uh, kind of kind of a challenge sometimes just with uh trying to uh, organize so many children that are trying to have fun and running around. Um, but it's, uh, I thought it was a really good opportunity just because uh, one, it was a bit of a challenge in an area that I haven't really been involved in, especially with the research. Uh, and uh, it gave me an idea of like maybe pediatrics in uh, the future, something I might want to do. Um, but as for the research, uh, essentially, it kind of exposed me to um, like getting involved with that. And uh, like, just for like a recent perspective from a student, if you're interested in research, uh, I definitely suggest like getting involved with your, uh, your professors and your like school's community. So like join clubs if you can, um, if, you, if you can go to as many office hours as you can just to meet your professors and uh, kind of get to know them and see what they're involved in and if it kind of aligns with what you're interested in with. Um, but yeah, uh, it obviously it helped me, um, especially with uh, the organizational aspect of it. It's uh, at the time I was just like a senior in college and not too organized with my time. And it really helped me with uh, getting organized and planning my time out. Uh, so I thought it was really, really good for me in that respect too. Uh, but yeah. Anything else I should say? Okay. Yeah, there will be the Q&A section. So yeah, somebody will ask about, yeah. Okay, so I will finish. Right, so. So unfortunately we were supposed to do this program again the last year, but because of the COVID just to start right now, but hopefully we can come back to the, uh, the school or with the children and then we'll provide this program again with um, uh, the many students. And also I'm thinking about to add more the variables kind of a uh, 
regulation skills and then or the academic skills to help them improve their uh, movement skills and the social skill and the self-regulation self skill and also the academic skills. So uh, any questions? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Xiong Ho and uh, Francisco for your time and for explaining this, another great research that you did. Uh, yes, so it's time for Q&A. So if anyone has any questions or comments on, on Dr. Uh, Seung Ho's research, now is the time. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for all of the presenters today. I really enjoyed um, everyone who presented and all of the information that was given. Uh, I found it very informative and uh, I definitely learned a lot from coming to this seminar. So thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, did, were, were, was each um, station approximately five to six minutes long? Yes. And did you, well, how was the student buy-in after the, the sequencing by the end? Were they fully on board? Did they enjoy that? So you mean uh, after the station? Yeah, well, no, 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 after, after the experiment, from the beginning to the end of the experiment. Did they, did they appreciate these short chunks of, of movement learning? Did it keep them occupied? And were they engaged? Yeah, sure. Because uh, even though they stayed uh, five or six minutes in the, uh, each station, there were so many uh, fish, uh, the San Jose State students helped. So it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one lesson almost. And then that's why I think uh, they have a lot of times, uh, there are a lot of times they can uh, learn. And then as the Francisco said, when we were there the first time, they didn't say anything to us, but when we uh, finished the program, they said, when are you gonna come back? We love this program. And then all parents and all students gave a good feedback and then they enjoyed and then, yeah. And then also school staff member uh, mentioned, please come back again. So I believe that they learned and then they got the, uh, be, um, I mean, the fun uh, experiences for the children and, and everybody, especially for the our students, the San Jose State students, because that was uh, the first time they worked with uh, young children. So it was very hard for them, our students, but finally they loved. Yeah, and, uh, some students had like favorite, favorite, uh, units so some preferred the bowling one uh so sometimes it'd be kind of tough to get them to move on to the next uh the next activity too do you think this could be applied in the physical education setting oh yeah sure yes because uh the program was uh uh the foundation of the program is from the physical education because my major is in physical education and then actually uh I have so many lesson plans and then I just modified and adjusted the lesson plan for these young children, especially the program should, I mean, the activity should be very fun. I mean, but if they lose the interest, they, they didn't try to do anything. So some, some fun things we uh, try to add for the each station. Yeah, it, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have a question from Deanna. Go ahead, Deanna. Um, yes, I had a question about these, uh, your future research. Um, I know you're going to expand the sample size. Are you going to also maybe change the age or are you just sticking with kindergartners to first graders? Yes, especially I'm really interested in young children, kind of preschoolers and then kindergartners. But actually in this area, it was hard to find a place. And then, uh, to do some of the big research, I mean, the conduct research, I need person, I mean, the people, but it's gonna be hard to get the uh, graduate student. And then all students are very busy in this area because I did almost the same, um, same program when I was in Ohio and Texas. And then at the time, uh, the resources are very enough to do this type of research, but now it's gonna be my uh, difficult so yeah, totally I'm trying, I will try to extend this uh, research, this project for different age and then different places here.
Anything else? Yeah, any anyone else have any more questions or comments? Well, okay, with that, I will say, um, I'll add in the chat box, our Success Center's website. Um, we'll also have this recording posted on our um, YouTube channel. It's the CHHS SSC YouTube channel. So that'll be there as well. So you can review it again. I wanna thank everyone again, um, our presenters, Dr. Xiong Ho Chang, Francisco Nunez and Dr. Michelle Hampton, Dr. Denise Dawkins and Raisa for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate um, all your research and your um, uh, informing us of all this information that uh, we, you know, you take the time to do. So I wanna say thank you so much again for everyone's uh, time and our participants for joining us today. Uh, this concludes our uh, event, and again, we have our Thank you.